And um, I'm really uh, pleased to be able to introduce uh, not only a, a good friend, but a longtime colleague. I think uh, Dorothy Northey and John Murdoch were the first two people from another laboratory uh, that I met when I started at Alameda County. Yes, January 2nd, 1970. And uh, it's kind of scary to think about that. But over the 25 years I've been the Founders Lecture Chair, I've been really pleased to bring, a, as Eric described, a wide assortment of, of people, uh, international guests like Doug Lucas and Stuart Kind, Margaret Pereira, but also good friends and colleagues from here in, the, in CAC, Jim White, Brian Raxel, uh, Chuck Morton, uh, Jim Osterberg, and uh, many others. So uh, in continuing that, uh, that theme of excellence, I'm really pleased to uh, be able to present uh, today's lecture. Um, John Murdoch has been, well, he's one of the few members of the CAC that's been around longer than I have. Uh, he's been a member of the CAC since 1967. He's actually a native of Illinois, something I actually didn't know until uh, just a few days ago. Uh, but somehow he found his way to Vallejo uh, to uh, finish an AA degree in, at the junior college there in 64. Uh, got his BS at UC Berkeley in 67, studied under Professor Kirk. 1970, he completed uh, his uh, master's in criminology uh, degree. But by that time, he was already three years into his career at Contra Costa County. Uh, he started there in 67. And um, by 79, he was made uh, supervisor. He was made lab chief in 83. Um, and um, it, and he retired in 93 and said, well, that wasn't enough. And so he joined uh, ATF as a firearms and tool mark examiner. He was there from 93 to 2008 and then retired from uh, ATF. And decided that still wasn't enough. So, well, why, why deal with a long commute? He went back to Contra Costa County as a contract consultant, and he's been there uh, since under a, under a contract to work firearms and tool mark cases. Particularly, I guess, I guess uh, Richmond alone keeps you more than fully employed, doesn't it, John? Yeah. Um, as I said, he's been a member of CAC since 68. He was president. He, he had to pick up the pieces after I was president in 83, John came along in 84 and tried to try to fix things. Um, he's had numerous service awards and we just, just don't have the time to go into that. Re recognized as distinguished member in 93, um, made a life member in 2010 as we just found out. Uh, but he's also been heavily involved in AFTI. He's made a, he was, uh, actually joined AFTI in 69, was made a distinguished member in 75 and has uh, uh, just, just as in CAC, fulfilled numerous services uh, in committees and, and board work and things like that. He was also uh, active in CACLD from 79 to 83 and ASCLAD from 83 to 93. Um, his list of publications goes into scores of, of uh, uh, present uh, publications on not only firearms and tool marks, as we might expect, but also fingerprints but especially the landmark work that he's done over the past 30 years or more on firearms and tool mark identifications. And every time somebody, one of these NAS people get up and say, well, like, firearms and tool mark identifications aren't science-based, I say, what about the 30 or 40 papers that <laughs> John Murdoch alone or in combination with Al Biasotti and Fred Tulliners and others have created over the past 40 years? Isn't that enough science for you? Obviously, it's not enough for some of these people because maybe because their clients go to jail because of the science that uh, John has published. Maybe that's their, their big issue. But interestingly enough, um, he's qualified as an expert, of course, not only in, in firearms and tool marks, but also question documents and latents uh, over the years at uh, Contra Costa County. Uh, teaching, of course, he's done tremendous teaching all over the world. He's been part of CCI uh, teaching uh, obligations for as long as I can remember. Uh, but he also taught at Los Madonos, he's taught at UC uh, courses and things like that. So uh, without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce the Founders Lecture for today, uh, Mr. John Murdoch. 
Thank you, John, for that kind introduction. I'm pleased to learn that I am your 22nd friend. <laughs> Mr. President, members of the CAC board, fellow members and guests, I consider it a real privilege to be able here, to be able to be here and to speak before you. is rare, so I really appreciate being given the opportunity. I apparently am John's last friend, the 22nd, to appear in this position. In preparation, I have done two things. First, I reviewed every founder's lecture, and they are all available except one, and that is the one by Chuck Morton. If any of you can find that or have that, PhD, and I would really appreciate it. The second thing I did was to consult all members of my laboratory, and I asked them, what would make it worth your while to sit in a room fairly cold, which is just for me, and listen to me for 45 minutes? I got some very interesting suggestions, and I decided to use most of them. Several others, like serving wine and mixed drinks, <laughs> I decided to defer, and I'm glad, because as I found out last night, there's plenty of that to go around. <laughs> Half of my lecture will be autobiographical, and during the other half, I will discuss nine areas of forensic science that are of special interest to me, and I sincerely hope they will be of special interest to you. Choices. Each of us has the power to make choices. This morning I'm going to discuss a series of choices that I've made. I grew up and attended high school in the Midwestern town, not city, of Wheaton, Illinois, 25 miles west of Chicago. I graduated from high school without distinction in 1956. This is me at the senior girls dance with my very good friend Sue Rohde. We were in there listening to Joe Williams. He was in Count Stacy's band at the Blue Note Cafe. It was a wonderful evening. It was a wonderful period of time. In high school I took every shop class, no college prep courses, and spent my after-school time playing baseball, basketball, and football, but mostly riding around in a series of very cool cars and motorcycles. <laughs> the editorial comment below my class picture is, studies bother him not, for, for he bothers not with studies. <laughs> This worked for me in high school. In addition to having my dad for eighth grade mathematics, I had him as a coach for all intramural sports. He was the best dad a guy could ever have. He taught me how to hunt squirrels and doves with a slide action 22 long rifle, pheasants with both 410 and 16 gauge shotguns, and rabbits with a club. Yes, I said club. It's not something you discuss at cocktail parties. But perhaps in the hallway I can show you how to hunt rabbits with a club. <laughs> Shortly after I graduated from high school, I got married and began to work construction as a laborer, concrete finisher, and electrician. But after working outside for several years in very cold Illinois winters, and seeing broken down men in the union halls waiting for work, I figured there must be a better way to make a living. So in 1960, I enlisted in the United States Air Force, and I spent nine months in jet engine mechanic training school. Since I was a little older than most other enlistees, I was made barracks chief. This is me outside of the barracks. I have a red rope around my left shoulder, which indicates I'm the barracks chief, and I was responsible for surprise security inspections at night. 
I had a room to myself, and soon the only room in the barracks, incidentally, and soon learned through stories told to me by other members of my barracks how fortunate the three Murdoch kids were to have been raised by such wonderful parents. Shortly thereafter, I wrote to them, and I told them, you know, I didn't know, I don't know how you guys raised us to have such high, con such high confidence and self-esteem, but I thank them a lot for what they have done for us. I am convinced that self-esteem is the greatest gift that a parent can give to a child. In 1961, I was sent to Travis Air Force Base in Fairfield, California. I worked on C-133 turboprop jet engines and on SAC B-52 bombers in major engine overhaul. But after seeing the dramatic difference in salary and clothing between enlisted men and officers, I decided to get the college education that I had avoided preparing for in high school. I sent to the University of California at Berkeley for the bulletin of the School of Criminology and learned about a profession called criminalistics. My first book on criminalistics was an introduction to criminalistics by O'Hara and Osterberg. If you don't have a copy, I would urge you to get one. It was written in 19, published in 1949. I was both inspired by the book and the following quote by Daniel Defoe that the authors included. I hear much of people's calling out to punish the guilty, but very few are concerned to clear the innocent. After learning what classes I had to take to enroll at UC Berkeley as a junior, I began to take them at Vallejo Junior College in Vallejo, California. In 1964, I graduated from there with an AA degree, was discharged from the Air Force, and began to take criminalistics classes at UCB under Dr. Paul Kirk. One of my textbooks was the book entitled Crime Investigation, written by Paul Kirk in 1953. This may be the only dust jacket you ever see. I've never seen another dust jacket for his book. So I would acquire this book if you don't have it. CAC members have heard about Dr. Kirk during at least four founders' lectures. Pete DeForest in 97, Jerry Chisholm in 2000, Chuck Morton in 2003, and George Sensabaugh more recently in 2012. They knew him in a more personal way than I did. I knew him as a student usually knows a highly regarded professor. Dr. Kirk required attention to detail and correct answers to the numerous unknowns we were required to analyze. His overall philosophy expressed in the syllabus to Criminology 151, which is illustrated here, is that if you missed an unknown, you had to do a second one for no more than half credit. If you missed that one, you had to keep doing unknowns until you got one right or no credit. But his main message was that in criminalistics, as you can see in the top line of the highlighted box, mistakes are not allowed. Dr. Kirk also wrote a book in 1949 that you may not be familiar with. It is entitled Quantitative Ultra Microanalysis. This is a second page of his book on quantitative ultramicroanalysis, and in the section entitled, chapter entitled Physical Methods, he has a paragraph which says, many compounds have been prepared in microgram quantities in connection with the study of the chemistry of the transuranic elements, the details of which may be found in specialized publication of the Manhattan Project. From 1942 to 45, Dr. Kirk worked on the Manhattan Project in the Lawrence Radiation Lab and on, in laboratories in Washington State and Chicago, Illinois. He separated plutonium, necessary for the development of the atomic bomb. He also authored over 200 articles in biochemistry and forensic science. At the end of an article by Dr. Kirk in the November 64 issue, of the UC Berkeley California Monthly, 
which should come up next. There it is. He is quoted as saying, some of my colleagues object to the fact that I've always shot off my mouth in an effort to say what I think. Well, he says, any field has to have some people who stick their neck out. Otherwise, there isn't much progress. I like this philosophy. And as I look back on my career, I find that I have conducted myself in much the same way. I would encourage you to do the same. Dr. Kirk's students worked very hard and spent long hours in his room 2590 in the Life Science Building. Ah, uh, yes. And here I am weighing something in connection, same year, 1967, in connection with solving an unknown. I graduated with a BS degree in 67, and although I was advanced to candidacy for the Doctor of Criminology degree, I settled for a master's degree because I didn't think that my dissertation, that my master's thesis was worthy of a dissertation, even though the School of Criminology said that it was. I was employed at the Contra Costa County Lab as a student worker in 66. And like John said, I began there in, as a criminalist in December of 1967. During the next 12 years, I progressed to the top position of criminalist. During these 12 years as a generalist, I worked on a wide variety of cases, as most generalists did then. Forensic biology cases, I built our first electrophoresis tanks at the DOJ lab in San Bernardino, examined trace evidence, and did a lot of firearms and tool mark cases. The next few slides show a little bit of that work. <laughs> and yes, you could smoke in the laboratory at that time. <laughs> Dwayne Dillon is in the center. Gary Midas Inc. is on the right. And we're determining ejection characteristics semi of semi-automatic pistols. And yes, we all wore ties all the time then. I did a lot of non-firearm tool mark cases which was good because when I went to ATF, I had to do a lot of them. I did a lot of, a lot of regular firearms cases, and here I am instructing at a crime prevention meeting about what you can do in court. I worked on the Ricky Ross case in Southern California, and this is a newspaper article that has to do with that, and this is the second part of that article. I processed a lot of crime scenes during my time at Contra Costa. There I am on the far right with my hands in my pockets. I like to think that it wasn't because it was cold, but because I was contemplating what to do at the scene. The Symbionese Liberation Army blew up a telephone transmission line in the Berkeley Hills. And there I am up on a cherry picker processing that scene for evidence. Betty Wordig was minding her own business in El Sobrante, California, when some guy came in and stabbed her to death and left a hunting knife in her left armpit area. You can see the knife in the bottom part of that picture. This turned out to be a rather infamous photo, aside from the very fashionable watch band that I have on at the time. One thing you can barely see in the lower right-hand corner are very, flash very fashionable plaid trousers which I'm glad you can't see more of. But I am removing that knife without wearing gloves. And when I returned to the laboratory in 2008, I learned that that was kind of an infamous photograph in the laboratory. So much so that DNA analyst Tony Wynn made a poster out of it. <laughs> Gary Sims, Benny Del Rey, and John Murdoch. Real criminalists don't need no stinking gloves. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Ezeline Morris was a young woman who saved $300 to visit her mom in New Orleans. This is her little home in Pittsburgh, boarded up now. But when she was there, two of her friends wanted the $300, so they used a hatchet to cut the arteries on each side of her groin area. She bled to death right there. This is a picture of the wounds, and this is a photograph of the axe left in place. It's a Boy Scout axe, done, used for the foulest of deeds. 
I went to the autopsy and prepared a template of those wounds. I went to the county hospital and had my own blood drawn, took it to Ezeline's house, and Marty Blake and I heated up my blood in, her, in, in Ezeline's saucepan to body temperature. And then I proceeded to do a series of tests where I swung the ax down on a sponge over wood after dipping it in my own blood. We, we papered the room and the bed with white paper. And this shows how I went about making those making those swings. This is a view from the back. This shows after I made one of the swings. I wanted to see from cast off blood patterns whether a right-handed or left-handed person had made those cuts. And it looked to me like both the right hand and left hand, or right and left arm, had been used. And as it turned out, the two people that had stolen her money, one was right-handed and one was left-handed. Whether both of them were involved or whether one switched the ax, I don't know. And this shows the cast-off pattern, at least one of them, that we got in the room. In addition to doing all the lab work and scene work during the 12 years, I was also a keen observer of supervisory and management practices during this time. These observations proved important as I moved up the career ladder. I joined the CAC in 68 and AFTI in 69, the year it was formed. I was supervising criminalists for about five years through 1983. I enjoyed this position because the lab director gave me the freedom to supervise without micromanaging. My supervisory philosophy was that while I didn't expect everyone to be at their best every day, overall I expected performance that was above average. I also banned use of the word or phrase consistent with. It was in general use at that time. I didn't know what it meant. It means nothing without explanation. So unless you're going to explain it, don't use it. And if you're going to explain it, you don't need to use it anyway. For the next decade, through 1993, I was a lab director at Contra Costa. I took what I thought were the best management traits that I had seen, vowed never to use the poorest ones I had seen, and I had some good teachers, and settled into being director. I also enjoyed this position because Sheriff Rainey, like the previous lab director, did not micromanage. He was a solid supporter of, of forensic science as well. When I went to him in 1984 and asked him for permission to run for the president-elect of CAC, he listened patiently while I explained the impact that it might have on my lab director position, the use of staff time, the use of copiers, the use of the telephone. He said, John, I'm not concerned with the impact because I'm confident that you'll balance things out. He says, you only have to promise me one thing, and that is that you'll do the very best job that you can if you become president of CAC. Now, what kind of a job do you do for a person that expresses that kind of confidence in you? In this way, Sheriff Rainey was much like Paul Kirk. I respected him, and I worked hard to live up to his expectations. I am very fortunate in my professional life because I have become associated mainly with people like this. I, in turn, have tried very hard to be a person who tried to provide what others needed and then stayed out of their way unless they asked for help. During my time with Contra Costa, I taught how to process crime scenes for 21 years at Napa and Diablo Valley College. From 1990 through 1997, I taught criteria for the identification of tool marks with Al Biasotti. In 95, Al and I were invited to write a chapter on firearms ID for modern scientific evidence, the law and science of expert testimony. Our chapter was published in 97 and contained for the first time recommended quantitative criteria for the identification of strided tool marks, known as QCMS. 
quantitative consecutive matching trial, which is the answer to one of the questions on the, the new member list. Seventeen years later, this criterion is still valid. When Al passed away in 1997, two weeks before the two-volume set of modern scientific evidence was delivered to his house, I continued to teach the Toolmark class with other CCI staff. In 2005, Bruce Moran started to teach the class with me. Bruce now co-authors the chapter in Modern Scientific Evidence with me, and we continue to teach this class in California and around the world. We were very fortunate to present it to 200 South African firearm and tool mark examiners in 2012, and more recently in 2014 in January. If you ever get a chance to go to Cape Town, take it. From 1986 to 93, until I retired from Contra Costa, I was a member of the County Toastmasters Club. Joining Toastmasters is, in my opinion, one of the best things a forensic scientist can do for themselves, both personally and professionally. Toastmasters helps you develop easily learned skills to enhance the quality of your oral communication, both in court and out. You might produce the highest quality casework, but if you're unable to effectively verbally describe what you did and defend your results and the propriety of your forensic specialty in admissibility hearings, you limit your effectiveness in speaking for the evidence because less weight will be given to your testimony. As lab director at Contra Costa, I spent a decade in ASCLAD. During this time, I witnessed the development of ASCLAD lab accreditation program. I believe that this program has been good for forensic science in the United States. I know that you have heard disparaging remarks about it during other founders' lectures. Some feel that it has stifled creativity and scientific curiosity. So in preparation for this lecture, I asked our supervisors and managers and I agree with their assessment that while accreditation has not stifled scientific curiosity, it has caused less time to be available for research because of the record keeping and audits that are required. Some sections of the laboratory, like DNA, are affected much more than other sections. I encourage, however, each of you to learn about lab accreditation and read the fine print so you can explain it thoroughly in court. Today's ISO accreditation helps encourage accurate lab results, which, of course, should be one of our main goals. I retired from Contra Costa in March of 93, took a one-week motorcycle trip in the rain to visit Ken Goddard at the Wildlife Laboratory in Ashland, Oregon, and promptly returned to the, to the bench as a firearm and tool mark examiner for the Bureau of ATF in their Walnut Creek, California laboratory. This is the quantitative statement that appeared in modern scientific evidence. Two groups of three or one group of six in a three-dimensional tool mark and the criteria is higher for two-dimensional, two groups of five or one group of eight, and those criteria still hold true. In other words, there has never been a known non-matching striated tool mark that exceeds this criteria. And three dimensions is determined if you can perceive contour using the regular optical comparison microscope is three-dimensional, varying shades of gray. If your stri appear to be virtually black and white, it's two-dimensional. When in doubt, use two-dimensional criteria. Sarah Walbridge and I went down to Los Angeles. I drove the mobile crime lab for ATF to a Citizens Academy. And of course, our hero is Al Pacino. <laughs> Why? Because he uses guns, and we love guns.
ATF is a large organization, three crime labs nationwide. Their service area was and still is very large, so I got to travel, which was good for me. I helped design the curriculum for the 12-month ATF National Firearm Examiner's Academy, NFEA, and I taught there for five years. I still evaluate all written assignments for the three-month phase one portion of that academy. I retired from ATF in 2008. I combined 15 years of federal service with four years of Air Force time for 19 years of federal service. And currently, after forming my own company, which I had to do to work full time, I work at Contra Costa on a contractual basis as a firearm and tool mark examiner. I feel very, very privileged to be able to work in the laboratory where I started 48 years ago. Our lab has just moved into much larger renovated facility and achieved ISO accreditation. I work in the comparative evidence unit pictured here with a hardworking, very talented group of examiners. I want you to pay special notice to, in the foreground, the cross swabs. The cross swabs are the comparative evidence unit's humble way of paying tribute and homage to the gold standard of DNA. <laughs> we had arranged for a spotlight to be come down on those swabs, but it didn't arrive in time for the photograph. And you can see the only person in the photograph that knew how to pose so they looked underweight is Terrence Wong. He is posed kind of sideways. <laughs> you think he would tell us this before the photograph was taken? No. He told us after the photograph was taken. Such is Terrence's way. We take our work very seriously, but we still have fun by making our own captions for heroic illustrations. Here are two of them. Symbolic of the comparative evidence unit's constant fight against the unrelenting backlog. <laughs> this is a typical member of our unit at the end of a workday. And the war is eternal. Their mission is just the beginning, so say the humble examiners from comparative evidence. <laughs> Physically, we're on the job. Mentally, we're on the rooftops overseeing Contra Costa County. <laughs> Our supervisor, who you saw pictured in the middle of the last photograph, Chris Coleman, is here and is now CAC president-elect something I urged Chris to do, and I'm very glad that he accepted the challenge. Being up in years, or as John Thornton would say, circling the drain of life, <laughs> I take some respectful kidding. Once, during a lab tour for some high school students, the tour guide pointed first to me, and then to an old court display of firearm muzzle-to-shirt distance determination. The shirt in the display was, is made up of dark blue, almost black, police officer uniform material. The tour guide, Tony Wynn, said that the display consisted of the great coat worn by President Abraham Lincoln when he was <laughs> shot at Ford's Theater, <laughs> and that I had processed the crime scene. <laughs> To which several students exclaimed and looked at me and said, how cool is that? <laughs> it would seem, at least in their high school, little emphasis is put on US history. <laughs> I also do private cases, some of them for the Innocence Project in Illinois. I've also defended the field of firearm and tool mark identification in several major Daubert admissibility hearings over the past few years. One of them, the Black Nell case, took place in Contra Costa County, 
Here is the comparative evidence section view of this case that we call the Battle of Blacknell. <laughs> Diana Garrido is the public defender poised above me in the illustration. <laughs> I am in a defensive posture. However, in my left arm, I have the sword of CMS. <laughs> and we prevailed. Another case, the McCluskey case, took place in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Here is the cover page for the motion to exclude. There were about 80 references attached to this motion, and I had to answer questions about most of them. My testimony is on the Swig Gun website under the admissibility resource kit for the McCluskey case, should any of you want to read it. I would like to turn your attention now to what I consider to be nine very important general professional responsibilities and offer comments on each. Number one, read historical literature about forensic science and keep current on the literature in your forensic specialty. Reading historical literature about forensic science makes it come alive, at least it did for me and gives the reader a real sense of belonging to a profession. Century of the Detective and Crime and Science by Thorwald would be a good place to start. With regard to keeping current, when I was lab director at Contra Costa, I encouraged reading of professional literature by requiring everyone to record their reading in a training notebook. Entries were redlined and dated following each annual evaluation. When the next annual evaluation rolled around, I expected some new entries to be present below the previous red line. Lab supervisors and managers should allow a certain amount of lab time for keeping current with the literature. But as professionals, we are expected to also read some professional literature during our off time. Keeping current is a two-way street. Two, produce quality case notes and laboratory reports. In my opinion, you should produce case notes of such quality that you are offended if those notes are not discovered and reviewed by opposing counsel. They should be of such quality that you could bring them to a meeting like this and set them up on a card table in the lobby and invite your colleagues to review them. That should be the standard. If you can't do that, then you're not taking good enough notes. They should be thorough and contain complete reasoning for conclusions reached, saying, for example, that no subclass influence is present on a tool working surface is inadequate without an explanation of what is present on the surface to justify your conclusion. Photomicrographs are mandatory when what you conclude, as we do in firearms and tool marks, on the basis of what you see. In this age of digital photography, there is no excuse for not taking them. Your lab reports should stand alone, such that they should explain the strengths and weaknesses of your analysis so completely that, if needed, your report could be introduced in court without accompanying testimony from you. They are often used this way by courts that review court cases. They review reports in the complete absence of expert witnesses. Whenever possible, meet with the attorneys that intend to call you as a witness so you can explain the best line of questions that will bring out the significance of your casework. If you meet alone with opposing counsel, public defenders, for example, to explain your casework and report, they might want to present hypotheticals to see if they are supported by your examination results. I encourage you to respond candidly to these questions, but under no circumstances should you reveal to the attorneys that will be calling you, deputy DAs, for example, what hypotheticals were discussed, because this would reveal some defense strategy. Contra Costa County criminalists have conducted themselves in this fashion for years. 
As a result, even though this conduct is not appreciated by some deputy DAs, the criminalists enjoy a good working relationship with the Public Defender's Office. I think this is important. Three, present effective testimony and advocate only the propriety of your casework. I have described the beneficial aspects of Toastmaster training. If you take it, you'll still be nervous before you give testimony, but you'll do such an impressive job of presenting your testimony that it will be viewed as trustworthy and accorded great weight. Have no professional interest in the outcome of any case in which you testify. Do not participate in any celebration after a verdict is returned. We develop truths about physical evidence. Courts dispense justice, sometimes with complete disregard for the truths that we develop. It is their right to do this. And there's no reflection on the information you have developed and are prepared to present or have presented in court. Persons accused of crimes have every right to be represented by skilled attorneys that are able to subject expert witnesses like us to probing cross-examination. If you're put off by being treated this way, I suggest that you get another job. Four, learn crime reconstruction. In the past several years, there have been several books written on the subject. One that I would recommend, entitled Crime Reconstruction, published in 07, revised in 11, is by Jerry Chisholm and Brent Turvey. The three chapters are especially good. One by Jerry Chisholm gives a brief history of pioneers in the field. One by Bruce Moran deals with the reconstruction of shooting scenes. And one entitled Crime Reconstruction Ethos and Ethics by John Thornton explains the thought process in involved in crime reconstruction. John says that it is the story rather than the evidence that will be applied to the ultimate determination of justice. Of course, it is the evidence, mainly, properly documented, collected, analyzed, and interpreted that forms the basis of the story. John Thornton's chapter is a must read for anyone doing crime reconstruction. A second recommended book published in 06 by Luke Haig and revised in 2011 by both Luke and Mike Haig is entitled Shooting Incident Reconstruction. It is a highly regarded treatment of this specialized forensic area. Peter DeForest, in his 97 Founders Lecture, stressed recapturing the essence of criminalistics by working with investigators at crime scenes to do crime reconstruction. However, the reality is that today, most scenes are not processed by criminalists, but by CSIs, crime scene investigators. Assuming the crime scenes are processed by properly trained CSIs, we can still do meaningful crime reconstruction by evaluating their work product. If you can provide training to CSIs from your client agencies, Contra Costa does. Once your laboratories have become proficient in crime reconstruction, let the local authorities know you can do this. So it can be requested proactively and not retroactively as a last minute response to a reconstruction done by some other expert or opposing counsel. Five, participate in research and write technical articles. For most of the forensic specialties, there are very few academic counterparts to produce the required scientific underpinnings. Practitioners must do it, while at the same time producing casework. The best forensic science laboratories will allow some of this research to be done on lab time, especially if it can be associated with casework. But some of it will usually have to be done on your own time. If you're able to team up and work with colleagues on research, this makes it more bearable. Once the research is done, it must be written for publication. This can also be a combined laboratory and personal time activity. Writing is not easy for most of us. In a recent article entitled Seduced by Twitter by Catherine Scully in The Week magazine, she describes writing in the following way. 
I began this piece by noting that writing my book involves spending four years in a figurative cave. In my experience, that cave is the necessary setting for serious writing. Unfortunately, it is also a dreadful place. It is cold, dark, and desperately lonely. 80% of the battle of writing involves keeping yourself in that cave. Waiting out the loneliness and opacity and emptiness and frustration and bad sentences and dead ends and despair until the damn thing resolves itself into words. That kind of patience, she says, a steady turning away from everything but the mind and the topic at hand can only be accomplished by cultivating the habit of attention and a tolerance for Solitude. Six. Prepare for 402 or Daubert admissibility hearing. The Daubert decision was rendered in 1993, and I think if I asked, you could all stand and recite the five Daubert criteria. The Daubert decision was a good one, and the criteria are relevant. Most states have either implicitly or explicitly adopted them. In some forensic labs, only one staff member is prepared to testify in such hearings. I believe that all staff members should be prepared to testify in hearings like that and defend their respective specialties because, number one, every expert witness should know the answers to those five criteria for their specialty, and two, the preparation will give them greater in-depth understanding of their subject matter and make them overall better witnesses. The learning curve can be steep, but the end result, in my opinion, is worth the effort. Number seven, join relevant professional associations and volunteer for committee assignments. While there are many reasons to join professional associations, it's my belief that a code of ethics with an enforcement procedure is the main one. The CAC has, in my opinion, the best of both. The code is comprehensive, and the enforcement procedure allows one, the CAC to enforce its code, and two, it affords those accused due process of law, which is essential. AFTI recognized the value of both of these documents and adopted them. Committees are the engines that drive professional associations. So gauge your strengths and volunteer for committee assignments. But be sure and balance your professional association involvement with your personal life. One of my colleagues, Eric Collins, usually works a lot of overtime when it is available and he's taken on a lot of committee responsibilities for AFTI, so much so that he became the subject of this Dilbert comic strip. Employee Assistant Program Executive Coach says, Eric, you need to focus on your career or your family. You can't do both. Eric says, I don't have a family, I have the lab. EAP Coach says, actually, Eric, you're married and you have four kids. Eric says, boy, that sounds like a huge hassle. <laughs> Perhaps you've already chosen, Eric. <laughs> Don't let this happen to you. Eight, participate in editorial review. <coughs> Forensic science journals, especially specific ones like the AFTI Journal and CAC News, are criticized for not having meaningful editorial review. Our critics say that since we pretty much all know each other, our editorial review is not critical enough to ensure that only sound scientific research finds its way into print. They compare us with non-forensic science journals where generally the editorial review is much more severe, often done by scientists that are doing research in direct competition, with that being done by other scientists whose articles they are reviewing. To a certain extent, I agree with this argument. This underscores the importance of critical editorial review. If you have the skill, and some people don't, 
I encourage you to volunteer to be an editor. To emphasize the importance of quality editing, my colleague Eric Collins, in his capacity as assistant editor of the AFI Journal, recently revised a manuscript review form, the one intended for use by an author's colleagues. To include the admonition, the editors are counting on you being honest and forthright in your review. Your signature on this form attests that you have performed your review in this manner. Of the six AFTI manuscript evaluation elements, I consider the two most important to be, number one, is this work significant and has sound scientific methodology been used? And two, if possible, how could the author add to the scientific value of the manuscript and what further research or work could be done to expand on the information presented? If you do not feel that you have the required skill in the conduct of inquiry, to evaluate these two elements, as well as evaluating grammar and sentence structure, volunteer for other committee assignments, because you would do more harm than good as an editor without having these skills. Nine, learn and teach the ethics of forensic science by using ethical dilemmas. And I am very encouraged to hear during Peter's talk, he listed probably eight or nine ethical dilemmas. So I'm very glad that he has lived up to Eric's admonition to continue working for CAC as long as you can. To quote Contra Costa's very capable QA officer, Shauna Meldrum, it seems over the past five years there's been an explosion of crime lab scandals in the news. Brett Turvey in his 2013 book, Forensic Fraud, says that major failures have occurred in more than 100 crime laboratories. An article entitled Forget CSI, a disaster is happening in America's crime labs by Jordan Smith appeared as recently as April the 30th of this year in Business Insider. It contains very little new information, but compares recent well-publicized crime lab transgressions with the way forensic science is portrayed on TV in shows like NCIS, Bones, Dexter, and many others. The author wishes that the, that the country's real-life crime labs were half as effective as they are portrayed on TV. How rude. Has all of forensic science lost its ethical compass? No, I don't think so. But you have to admit that the scandalous transgressions of a few make us all look bad. I gave an address here at the CAC meeting in San Diego in 1998 entitled, Ethics is Not a Dirty Word. My message then and now is that crime labs can create a culture of ethical conduct by engaging in training based on an evaluation of ethical dilemmas. I recommend that your lab quality assurance officer distribute on a regular basis ethical dilemmas, such as the ones that Peter discussed this morning, and require staff to evaluate them against a code or codes of ethics. When I was lab director, I used a series of ethical dilemmas in this way. They were written by Pete Barnett and Parker Bell. Carolyn Gannett has been doing a good job lately of writing a column for our CAC News using ethical dilemmas. Requiring ethics codes to be used in this comparative way requires staff to study them and see how they may be applied in various circumstances. There's something else that I think would help create a culture of ethical conduct in the CAC. I have discussed this with Eric within the last several months. This is the publication in the CAC News of summaries of CAC ethics hearings. These hearings are often sparsely attended by members. These summaries, including the reasoning used to render decisions, would help create a common law type of knowledge among our members. This knowledge could help members reach proper decisions when ethical dilemmas are encountered in real life. You can find a summary like this that I wrote as CAC president in the January 1986 issue of the CAC News. I received the notice that Eric sent out following the hearing in Modesto. However, it told me nothing about 
how the decision was rendered and provided no guidance for future decisions that I might have to make. If a crime lab does not have their own ethics code, the lab can adopt a professional association code and make it a part of their own policy. In this way, you can require adherence by staff that do not join any forensic organization. You can enforce these adopted codes because transgressions can usually be viewed as conduct tending to bring the reputation of your parent organization into disrepute. Joe Peterson and I described this adoption procedure in a Journal of Forensic Science article we wrote in 1989. Something else that might help reduce the explosion of transgressions is to encourage the adoption of a personal statement of ethical behavior. Such a statement was proposed for the forensic scientist by John Thornton for a book he was writing in 1998. This is the page 138 from John's manuscript that contained his draft of a statement of ethical behavior. He didn't finish his book, but he modified this statement and tailored it for crime reconstructionists. It can be found in John's chapter on ethos and ethics that I described earlier in Chisholm and Turvey's book on crime reconstruction. In 1999, I printed a copy of John's original 1998 statement, signed it, and displayed it prominently in my work area. This is the statement that I had typed out and signed. It is still on display there. I think every forensic scientist should do the same. If I were to be a lab director again, I would display John's general statement in the lobby. I would like to conclude my lecture this morning by describing my personal philosophy of the conservation of emotional energy. Each of us only has a finite amount of it at any given time. To help me conserve mine, I try my best to live by the following motto, written in 1894. One day at a time, this is enough. Do not look back and grieve over the past, for it is gone. And do not be troubled about the future, for it has not yet come. Live in the present and make it so beautiful that it will be worth remembering. Although I do not expect things to go wrong, I try and anticipate how they could. And therefore, when they do, I'm not surprised. This makes it easier for me to conserve emotional energy and to react calmly and say, OK, it's happened. Now what do we do? I deliberately do not let my blood boil by reacting badly. Reacting badly burns up valuable emotional energy and has a very negative effect on both you and those around you, which is simply not fair. As I said when I began, each of us has choices. This morning I have described some that I have made. The importance of choices was made real clear to me by Viktor Frankl. He was a prominent psychiatrist in Vienna when, in September of 1942, he and his family were arrested and sent to a Nazi concentration camp. By the time the camp was liberated three years later, most of his family had been killed, including his pregnant wife. He survived, and in 1946, wrote, Man's Search for Meaning. In 1990, the Library of Congress and the Book of the Month Club listed this book as one of the 10 most influential books in the United States. In this book, which I highly recommend, he concludes that finding meaning to life, meaning, not happiness, made many prisoners far more resilient to suffering than prisoners who had lost hope. Frankel concluded that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, which is the last of human freedoms. And that is the ability to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. So no matter what happens to us, no matter how we are treated, we can choose how we react to it. 
In closing, I sincerely hope that each of you finds meaning in your own life, both personal and professional, and that you get as much pleasure as I do in exercising control over your own choices. John. <laughs>